Good morning, everybody. The first day of the AI West and the first session. Uh, my topic is dry eye and the cl classification and the diagnostic approach. When we define dry eye, it, it's basically a disorder of the tear film, either due to tear deficiency or excessive evaporation, which can damage the ocular surface. This definition has further been uh, improved upon by the dry eye workshop committee, and now it, it's basically considered as a multifactorial disease of the tear film and the ocular surface, which results in basically ocular discomfort, visual disturbance, and tear film instability, and this has a potential damage to the ocular surface. And the two key elements are uh, hyperosmolarity of the tear film and inflammation of the ocular surface, an understanding of which helps us in the management of the dry eye condition. Basically, if you want to classify the dry eye, this classification is again from the dry eye workshop committee, in which, was, uh, uh, which met in 2007. And it basically classifies the dry eye into two compartments, one which considers uh, deficiency of the aqueous component of the dry eye, and the two main divisions are the Jogren's and the non-Jogren's dry eye. Jogren's can again be primary or secondary, depending on whether there are systemic associations or not. And the non-Jogren's can be the various forms of either lacrimal gland abnormalities or the duct obstruction or reflex block or effect of systemic medication. The evaporative dry eye, again, is more common in clinical practice that we see, and this is uh, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic is, again, what you see more commonly associated with Mabomian gland uh, diseases. Uh, you can have disorders of the lid, uh, low blink rate, and, again, uh, specific action of drugs on the ocular surface. Extrinsic can be vitamin deficiency, A deficiency, which leads to surface keratinization, topical drugs with preservatives, contact lens wear, refractive laser procedures, and ocular surface allergy. If you look at the mechanism of the dry eye, the, the two key components, as we spoke about, one is the hyperosmolarity and the tear film instability. The, these two, they activate various uh, cytokines and enzymes on the ocular surface, which damage the epithelial cells, reduces the goblet cell population, and results in more apoptosis of the cells. And this irregular surface further leads to tear film instability, and the movement of the lid on the dry ocular surface also results in more inflammation. So what do you do when you have a patient with dry eye? How do you go about diagnosing a patient with dry eye? Well, the dry eye workshop recommendation gives a whole list of tests that need to be performed to be able to, you know, classify and clinically, uh, you know, uh, grade the severity of the dry eye. But all these tests are not possible in a routine clinic. So what do we look at? If we look at the symptoms of dry eye, basically either with the irritation, which can be burning sensation, foreign body sensation, dryness, and so on, various, uh, you know, muc mucoid discharge or tearing, and uh, visual symptoms, these are the three main categories into which dry eye symptoms can fall. But the problem with these symptoms are that based on their symptoms, there is poor correlation with the clinical signs. The ocular surface lacks specific neural receptors for dryness. And the dry eye, is, is, it's a dynamic uh, condition. Depending on the external environment, the symptoms wax and wane. And on top of that, you have the variable toleran tolerance level of the patient as well. So which can, you know, so based on the symptoms alone, you can... You cannot diagnose or grade. So what, what do we use in the clinical practice? There is a very nice uh, questionnaire, which is called the Ocular Surface Disease Index, a set of 12 questions which are basically uh, related to the dry eye. And patients uh, can be given this when they're present at the clinic, and they, they score on a, on a grade from 0 to 4, and the sum of all those questions answered divided by the total number of questions answered gives you a, a value between the 0 to 100. Higher the score, more severe the disease. This can be given when, before when you see the patient. Again, when the patient on therapy comes back for follow-up, if you give the same questionnaire, you can assess whether the patient is getting better or worse. This can even be downloaded from this address. Assessment of corneal sensation, yes. You can do that either by contact or non-contact method. Uh, the Cocket and bonnet esthesiometer, which is basically consists of a monofilament nylon thread, 0 to 60 millimeter. Longer the thread, more sensitive the cornea. The second one uses the pulse of air or air carbon dioxide mixture, and that way also you can grade the corneal sensation. We know that as the dry eye becomes more severe, the corneal sensation finally reduces. This is something that we do more commonly in the clinic, the Shermer's test or a phenol red 
thread test, and this basically looks at the amount of uh, tears that are produced. Well, the Shermer's one is what we popularly do in the clinic without an anesthetic, and if this is less than five millimeters it, in five minutes, it is considered as abnormal. Beyond that, sometimes uh, the test can be very nonspecific and quite variable. You can look at measurement of tear clearance after application of fluorescent dye to the inferior cul-de-sac. You can apply the fluorescent strip at different intervals at 5, 10, 15 minutes, and you can look at the amount of staining that remains. In a normal case, the staining gradually decreases over a period of time, whereas when you have an NLD, when the tear clearance is delayed, you can see that the staining remains. So this kind of gives you an idea that the tear clearance is not there. And sometimes because of that, if the inflammatory mediators remain on the surface, that can again increase the symptoms of the dry eye. There is a new device that allows you to measure the tear film osmolarity. That's from tear labs, and this can be applied to the ocular, to the lid margin to collect the tear film, and that gives you uh, the osmolarity, and the normal osmolarity is somewhere between 290 to 295, and if it is greater than that, that again tells you that the, the severity of the dry eye. There was a paper published last year in American Journal of Ophthalmology where they looked at uh, the comparison between osmolarity and the other clinical tests, and they found that if the osmolarity is uh, cut off is greater than 311 milliosmoles per liter, the sensitivity and specificity are quite high as compared to the other tests. The other thing that you can do, which again, with the, this is done on an OCT to look at the tear film meniscus, and we know that the normal meniscus is greater than 0 0.035, and in dry eye, this meniscus reduces, and that can also give you some grading about the severity of the dry eye. The other clinical test which I rely on very much is the tear film breakup time, and here you look at the after a normal, you stain the tear film with fluorescent, and after a normal blink, you look at the time duration it takes for a, a random uh, spot of dryness that appears, uh, and the, the, the non-invasive test can also be done without application of fluorescent, where you project an image of a grid onto the tear film on the cornea, and you look at uh, the time taken for the grid to become distorted. You can even do that on your corneal topography, and even if you have a dilated pupil, you can look against the red reflex and look at the breaking up of the tear film. Diagnostic dye staining is also important. You can use rose bengal uh, fluorescein and rose bengal or fluorescein and lysamine green. Fluorescein stains the defects in the corneal epithelium. Rose bengal and lysamine green basically cells which are devoid of mucin and devitalized cells. Rose bengal staining, the two patterns that, the, the common pattern that we use is called the Van Bissewal scoring, where the nasal and bulbar conjunctiva are graded from 0 to 3 and the corneal surface from the same. The other one is the LEMP scoring, where the cornea is divided into five zones and the nasal and bulbar conjunctiva are divided into further into three zones, and that can be used to grade the staining pattern. Fluorescent staining, yes, it's more commonly used. And depending on the pattern of staining, you can get some idea as to you know whether there is exposure, whether it's a diffuse, or whether it's just limited to the superior part of the cornea, as in superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis. Impression cytology, uh, not done clinically, but it can be performed where you use cellulose acetate filter paper, small, small bits, and you apply in different parts of the conjunctiva. And then you peel it off, and then you do staining, the past staining, and you look for squamous metaplasia. You look at loss of goblet cell, increased cytoplasmic nuclear ratio. This is a normal one. Here you can see this arrow shows a double nucleus in the cell. Here you can see some amount of keratinization. The other thing that you need to do is to assess the meibomian gland. You look at the tear film. If you're against a dilated pupil, if you look at the red reflex, you can see all these kind of oily particles which are there in the tear film, the tear film debris. Look at the lid margin for anterior or posterior uh, lid involvement in terms of blepharitis where you see loss of lashes, colorates. Or you look at the posterior lid margin, look for this kind of frothing uh, at the posterior lid margin which tells you that the meibomian gland function is not correct. Or you can see pouting of the meibomian uh, orifices. Look at the eyelids as well. Uh, you, you can see, uh, like in a case of post Steven Johnson's, you can see some amount of scarring, rounding of the posterior lid margin, some amount of keratinization. In a trachomatous case, you can see similar uh, scarring on the tarsal surface with a slight deformity of the lid margin. This, in, in elderly patients, look for lower lid laxity, or you can look at the upper lid entropion, all this which may be responsible for the tear film instability and the patient's symptoms. Last but not the least, you also have to look at the systemic medication, whether the patient is taking any uh, antihypertensive, antihistamines, or antidepressants. 
uh, specifically ask for dry mouth or dental and gum disease, which are again associated more frequently with dry mouth. Look for any symptoms of arthritis. Examine the hand for deformity of the fingers. Any previous history of drug reactions or allergy or thyroid disorders, which may be, uh, which may result in uh, increased width of the palpable fissure. So basically, in the clinic, when you look at uh, dry eye, the assessment, you grade the, you look at the ocular symptoms. I would use the ocular surface disease index questionnaire to look at the patient response. After this, you go ahead do a tear film breakup time. If the tear film breakup time is normal, then most likely the patient symptoms are not related to the tear film disturbance. However, if the tear film is uh, breakup time is less than normal, then which basically indicates that there is tear film instability. Then we look at whether it is aqueous deficient, whether there is a deficiency of the tear production. If the tear production is normal and there is tear film instability, most likely it is because of meibomian gland disease. However, if the tear film production is reduced, then it's labeled as aqueous tear deficient, and we try to see whether it is Jogren's or it's non-Jogren's. So this is in comparison. This is in conclusion uh, uh, an approach to a patient with a dry eye, and th this is a very simple and practical approach that you can use in the clinic. And I think this, if you apply to your management of dry eye patient, uh, it, it, it would go a long way uh, in achieving success uh, in managing the condition of the patient. Thank you.